Um, today, we're very, very honored to have a special guest, um, Natalia Modanova. Did I get that right? Yes. From that's Dress right. X. <laughs> and um, Dress X is probably one of the most popular platforms in the whole metaverse, certainly the number one fashion platform. Um, but overall, I think they cover a lot of different grounds. We're going to get into that today. Um, so thank you again, Natalia, for joining us. Let's start out with some background, because I know you have a very interesting background. You're from Ukraine, but tell me how you came through from your education up to your fashion um, involvement, and then how you came over here, and, and we'll get into the whole uh, metaverse space. Sure. Uh, first of all, hello, and thank you for inviting to share a story and to share a vision. And uh, I, yes, come from Ukraine and uh, there was a journalist and worked in media and uh, I witnessed this transformation of printed media into online, was launching the uh, website of the magazine I was working at. And uh, that was uh, an interesting uh, journey, of course, many years ago. Uh, and uh, then we teamed up uh, with Daria. And when she launched the Fashion Week uh, in Ukraine, I was uh, part of the team from day one. And uh, we built a platform for the designers to show their talent and creativity and here again you can see some parallels that because we are giving the platform to the digital fashion designers now and uh, when the first war started in 2014 uh, we saw the designers losing their local markets and that's why we built a platform an international platform to help them tackle international markets uh, and connect with the stores and that was uh, definitely a good decision and opened up uh, a lot of opportunities to the whole generation of the designers and to everyone who goes after them. Uh, not only designers from Ukraine, by the way, we've worked with designers from like Georgia, Greece, Italy, uh, Korea, uh, from everywhere in the world, basically. And uh, we also witnessed another uh, kind of uh, revolution that was happening uh, in combination with the tech, because we noticed how e-commerce retailers were striving and how orders from e-commerce retailers would grow every season, but uh, orders from physical stores would go down. So basically, of course, if you are implementing technologies, this is something that will bring you to success. And we were thinking, okay, how the experience of, of fashion can be also democratized without uh, environmental uh, cost for that. Uh, and uh, we came up with the idea of giving the experience of wearing really cool fashionable items uh, to everyone, anywhere in the world, doesn't matter your gender, doesn't matter your location. Uh, you can just uh, access it and uh, yeah, be uh, kind of fashionable. <laughs> uh, and uh, tech, of course, gives this opportunity. In 2018, we experimented a lot with augmented reality and with this use case when you, for example, can scan a QR code on a T-shirt and have a beautiful uh, kind of uh, AR happening around you or even scan not just QR code, but uh, some print artwork on, on your outfit and still have additional experience through AR. However, I was um, like, I was dreaming a lot on this use case that we deliver now when we can scan a full body and just uh, kind of show completely different outfit on yourself. And uh, we started from this use case on the photos. Uh, when when pandemic hit and we understood we are locked for a long time and uh, we are not coming back to the same normal, the new normal will be different. Uh, and a lot of people adopt a lot of digital habits and our digital presence became super important. And it was the case, not just for some influencers or YouTubers, everyone is spending a lot of time online. And for that, we give a digital wardrobe, we give a meta closet, meta wardrobe, uh, your storage of uh, digital outfits and you select what you want to wear and which digital space you are going to attend and uh, appear in an appropriate outfit for that matter. And that's how we see DressX and that's how we build it and still a lot of things to build, but we are definitely kind of 
uh, happy to deliver on this vision step by step. So there's a lot to unpack in there. You guys started at Mercedes Benz Fashion in Ukraine, right? Which was a physical fashion day, just like just like Fashion Week in New York or Fashion Week anywhere else. And you moved, you saw an opportunity with digital because you, you knew that that would encompass the globe. I mean, the entire world can participate. And so you guys, and I, I also um, spoke with um, Dina from Diverge because she's also from Ukraine. I know she's friends with you guys. But it seems like in, in the metaverse in particular, and especially with AR, fashion becomes much more of a statement, right? You can, you can express yourself and change immediately, whether you're going into a work environment or a play environment or um, a concert or anything that where you're, where you're traveling inside this space, you can express yourself in ways you couldn't physically do in, in real life, right? I mean, you can wear one dress, but to go change that into another dress, you have to go somewhere and come back. Whereas in this space, you could you could basically click, click a button, but also the depth of expression, right? I'm, I'm watching your your bucket hat, which is it's gorgeous, changing every two seconds. You can make that any color, any texture, any size, any shape that you want immediately, right? So the expression is actually deeper than it would be in real life. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely, and this is very inspiring. Of course, uh, we know very well that. There are still limitations for digital fashion, but it's just, just the different limitations uh, that are in a physical fashion. And it's really interesting to go beyond the physicality and uh, have some like animated outfits. And uh, there are a lot of other opportunities that you can pursue uh, in digital that you cannot do in physical. Um, however, we have to understand that fashion is, uh, is the language. It's a visual language of communication. And uh, even when we look in IRL, <laughs> fashion industry, still um, there is a difference between just outfit and the fashion outfit. There is a difference between apparel industry and fashion industry. And uh, really the uh, main, they main an important functionality of the fashion item is to the deliver certain message that you belong to certain community, that you belong to certain like status when it comes to like haute couture and like luxury, right? Uh, that you belong to certain culture and your background is uh, something that you want to communicate. And a lot, a lot of other different messages and uh, why we moved to like handwriting and using a pen in a physical space to deliver certain message to the typewriting and we send the text and we send an email we send a message on discord we do a tweet and this communication is happening mostly in digital right now and of course this visual communication through fashion should also have a space for for it to happen in a digital spaces because we do communicate a lot uh online but you're also mate you're democratizing it right whereas hook couture and a lot of high fashion is very exclusive. It's very expensive. It's very mm -hmm. hard to get. The average consumer doesn't have access, especially if you're in a, in a, in a country or an area that's not as well developed, right? Mm -hmm. But with a digital fashion, and I know you guys have a, have, a, have a mobile app now, which I think is anybody with a phone that has internet, internet access would have full access to that. Mm -hmm. And I know some of your stuff, I mean, it trades at I was just looking, I mean, you know, $65, $35, $100, $1,000, $1, whatever the number is, it's much more affordable and and it's not as limited as if I had to go to Paris or I had to go to New York or Tokyo, right? So what do you think about the ability of your global reach now where with mm -hmm. fashion where maybe that wasn't possible five years ago? So for us, it has always been important to build uh, the... Uh, company and to build a solution that is scalable we have always been inspired by example of like i don't know like instagram and a company having 15 employees and uh, giving a global impact and serving millions of users so that's uh, what inspires us and what we definitely want to deliver and on our way and speaking of democratizing fashion that's exactly what we are doing but again uh a lot of lessons uh, can be learned from what have been done already. And uh, 
we remember that mass market fashion like H&M was already democratized fashion a lot and like bravo for that, but it was coming with a significant environmental cost because of the uh, certain kind of from the production like rules and rules of the physical world. And uh, here um, we remember these collections of like Karl Lagerfeld for H&M, Versace for H&M, Margiela for H&M. It also was a tool for, to democratize fashion. And we are confident and we are sure that every brand will have a line of digital fashion. And uh, it's actually the category for all the brands, luxury brands and mass market as well. Uh, it's just a matter of how you translate it into the space and how you make it accessible or not. But also think about other categories, like, for example, beauty. All the luxury brands have a category of beauty, but of course, it's a different price point. When you buy a Chanel uh, bag or when you buy a Chanel lipstick, it's a completely different price, but with the same brand. And of course, Chanel lipstick is so much more affordable for the broader audience, for way more people on the planet Earth. It doesn't mean that um, a kind of luxury consumer would have like tens of this lipstick, but someone who cannot afford it will have one, but will al already be associated with this luxury product. So this is democratizing uh, the fashion and luxury. And in a way, we also democratize fashion and luxury because someone will say that $10, it's too expensive for digital outfit or like $50 is too expensive for digital outfit. But still, this is something that is affordable and uh, it's really kind of a choice. And we give this choice and we give this opportunity. Well, you make it a good point because you're also democratizing the production side. Right. And I think there's going to be a lot of younger designers and younger artists and creators that don't have to worry about startup costs, inventory costs, manufacturing costs, relationships with manufacturers, right? Staffing up a, a whole room of cutters and sewers and people that are producing where they don't even know if there's going to be demand yet. Right. One of the things that used to fascinate me about fashion was how do they know how many they're going to sell? Right. You, you, a lot of places, and I know it's probably more mass market and apparel. But if, if, if you're going to produce a line, you have to do it in different sizes. You have to do it in quantity at some, some level, whether it's 100 goods or 1,000 goods or 10,000. There's a lot of costs associated with creating that, shipping that, storing that, right? And if it doesn't sell in that season, then what do you do? Now you've got a whole warehouse full of, of apparel or, or, or goods that you have to very heavily discount or give away. So I think you're, you're, you're right. There's no more waste or there's a lot more less tons factors less waste and if you know that a product is hot like you're wearing a particular thing and, and all of a sudden you get a lot of attention you know you can focus on that versus having to develop you know a whole line and not be sure which ones are going to be successful so i'm just, guys like chris lay at artifact and people that are that are really creative coming into the space without having to have huge bank roles or partnerships behind them um and, and chris is working with nike I, I think you guys know that but that's that's an example where a, a big brand is now embracing kind of the startup culture and kind of guys that are on the more creative side. And I think you're doing that with Meta. You're doing that with um, Ready Player Me. I mean, there's a number of companies you guys are partnering with, right? That's right. Yes. Well, uh, of course, uh, that's democratizing not only from the customer perspective, but also from the creator perspective. And uh, that's exactly the core of the uh, kind of designers who are available under sex platform it's like uh, the barrier to start your fashion brand uh, is quite high you need like tens of thousands of dollars to create a collection to create samples to market it to show it as a fashion week or uh, even if you don't show it in any fashion week still to reach out to press to to start on your website, to build your e-commerce. And yes, there are a lot of tools that simplify it, like Shopify, but still it's a huge cost, especially for the physical production of the items and then on the distribution on, of them. Um, but with digital, uh, it's really kind of faster and easier and uh, more accessible to start your own brand. And that's actually, uh, I like what you mentioned that corporate corporations 
implement the startup um, kind of approach. And uh, it really is a truth because a lot of the innovations happened uh, through what we launched with different uh, kind of younger fashion designers. And it was a lot of fun, interesting cases that has been created. And then bigger brands and corporations started to understand like, oh, wow, it's actually can be done in a fun way. And okay. And then this uh, Bloomberg, Morgan Stanley and other researches came up kind of proving that with their kind of forecasts uh, in terms of numbers and that it's going to be a big market. So uh, for us, it's, it's been pretty clear from day one when we were starting it, that it's going to be a big market, that there are a lot of different fun and interesting and engaging use cases. And this is a new kind of language and this is a category that everyone will embrace and the most important that there will be a space for everyone for smaller brands for bigger brands and uh, that's that's very exciting and we love that it's a very inclusive space so is DressX more focused on creating your own lines and pushing them out or are you also interested in partnering with existing brands and pushing them through the digital space so how we work, uh, we started from the first use case of dressing up people on the photos. Uh, we polished this use case and we opened up an opportunity for other designers to create for this use case. And then opening up new, new utilities, we first of all test the grounds and pave the way on our own dress acts and house development and collections in order to give an opportunity to other creators to embrace this path moving forward. Because you know, being first and like paving the way, sometimes it's like a bumpy road and it's like more difficult and we don't want to burden the community with that. And we kind of want to build up these roads that everyone will be taking. Interesting. I, I, I see that. And I, I always wondered if people, if DressX would sign, you know, your own designers, for example, and then have a, have a line or have multiple lines and then also work with bigger brands because I know a lot of bigger brands have an issue jumping in. They don't know where to connect, right? They're not used to this different mentality where you're expressing yourself digitally um, versus having it, like you said, having, having a show or a runway show, which I'm sure will exist digitally, but it's such a big, you know, fashion weeks around the world are such big events and they're so expensive. Um, it's, it, it seems like they have to almost shift their thinking to adopt the kind of, you know, the kind of platforms that we're talking about. Where, yeah. do, you, where do you see the interoperability issue? Cause I know that's kind of mm -hmm. a problem. Um, you know, you don't want to buy, even if it's $65 or a hundred dollars, you don't want to buy one dress or one, one piece of fashion and not be able to wear it in more than one metaverse. Right. So how do you, how are you guys working on that? And where do you see that going? Uh, yes, uh, basically there are two aspects to interoperability. First is interoperability of the 3D files and 3D assets. And then the second is interoperability of the ownership. Because um, I think uh, most of people who are kind of talking about it, first of all, think about interoperability of the files, which is an issue, which is, of course, a technical challenge to, to create uh, files for different platforms or to like automatically adopt them for different platforms. And there's no tool out there that would do that. However, we are very closely like studying this subject and building for different platforms in order to kind of automate certain processes, find similarities and streamline this process in the future. And uh, that's where our expertise is. And uh, we continue collaborating with different platforms in order to make it possible in the future. However, right now, this is not the case. And uh, tomorrow, this is not the case. It will take a little bit of more time. And also, speaking of interoperability, oh, sorry, <laughs> speaking of interoperability of um, uh, ownership, that's also another important subject. And here, um, it's it's a broader question for this kind of corporations that are gatekeepers and that own the audience in a way that they own the assets that audience are using in the platforms. But I think that with all the um, ecos of Web3 and uh, 
really kind of demand from the community, from people, from consumers uh, to have something like that. Companies will collaborate and find a way to make it happen. Uh, there is an example of interoperability with like Meta when it comes to the avatars in Instagram and avatars in VR in Horizon Worlds and in Facebook and in WhatsApp. It's kind of this promise of interoperability that is now is kind of built inside one ecosystem, but hopefully will also go beyond uh, with different SDKs and uh, different solutions. So I think um, it's pretty clear that this is a solution that people would demand and we are happy to contribute and build in such a solution. Well, I think you guys are really smart to have the meta closet, right? Because I don't know if that's your thing or if that's part of a collaboration with meta, but having almost a third party agnostic storage vault for your fashion means that you guys can offer updates or upgrades or ways to make them interoperable maybe later if that becomes available. But you, like you said, it is a big problem. And the ownership between some of the centralized, let's call them gaming platforms like a Roblox, a Roblox versus like Decentraland or the Sandbox where they're, they're less centralized and the ownership really rests with the creator. Um, I do see that as an issue because you could write skins for, you know, Fortnite all day long, but Fortnite owns that IP, right? You might get a piece of it as a, as a designer, but they're going to own that, like you said. Whereas if you develop something in Sandbox, you're going to be able to own that. So I think that's going to be where these things clash. I know the creator slash consumer line keeps blurring in the metaverse because the same people that are using the goods are creating the goods. And I think as the values transfer back and forth, that's going to become very important. So I, I like the idea. Is the meta closet yours or is that a, something you're doing in, in collaboration with meta? It's a dress X meta closet. So as soon as you download the app, you have your meta closet ready to go. And we are very clear about the utilities that we provide uh, for every single item. So for example, with this generative uh, head drop, we are very clearly saying that you can wear it in augmented reality even before you reveal the item. So it will be changing different traits and colors so it's kind of you can start wearing even before you reveal it because for us it's super important to deliver this utility and even if you haven't revealed an item you can already start wearing it and it's uh, it's a basis for us and then as soon as you reveal you can dress up your photos you can dress up your pfps and you can uh, have access to the events uh, like, for example, to the digital fashion breakfast, which we hosted during Miami Art Week together with the fabricant. Uh, and there will be more of event like that. And, uh, of course, uh, the holders of the item will be able to access to it. So um, that's one part. And we are very clear that your items that you buy uh, for your meta avatar, uh, you can only wear them inside this ecosystem and as soon as other use cases arise so of course we will uh, be sharing more of it but it's really interesting that different spaces also have different um, styles and we can say that is similar to the real world like okay you buy a i don't know like um, dress uh, some like evening dress and you won't wear it to gym or you won't wear it to the business meeting. And you technically can wear it everywhere you go, but you wouldn't do that. So we kind of style items for certain environments, uh, considering where and how they will be used. So um, kind of given this opportunity to be relevant to the space where you are. How do you see the secondary market developing? Are you seeing people taking the fashion, using it, and then reselling it? Or where do you see that going? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, definitely there is a room for that. And um, we see it available only for the items that are dropped as NFTs. And a lot of digital fashion exists as non-NFT uh, because not everyone adopted this like web3 technology so far uh, however we are happy to meet a user where 
in Web3 and in Web2 as well, whenever, whatever is comfortable for them in order to educate um, about all the possibilities and about the possibility of this utility to wear digital fashion. And um, speaking of secondary market, I'd say there should be first a critical mass of the products in order to uh, have, like in order to one have the bigger value than the others. So we can see it again happening in the traditional fashion industry when um, there is a lot of different clothes. And that's why certain clothes is more valuable than the other because it's like more unique or because it's like a historical designer or because it's a very important piece uh, of the collection or because Mary J. Blige was wearing it on a Super Bowl halftime show and done this uh, brand created this outfit. Um, but uh, first, I believe there should be a critical mass of the items in order to start this like competition for more rare ones or... Oh, yeah, like that. <laughs> well, there's going to be vintage, right? There's going to be someone that says, hey, this yeah. was the first Dress X collection piece. Uh, this is the first Burka bag, whatever whatever that might be. I think you're going to see people hold. And then mm -hmm. as you know, time goes by, they're going to say, this is a vintage item. It might be worth X, Y, Z, whatever. You're seeing that with the sneaker market, right? Stock X. Yes, and the, yes and the... absolutely. <laughs> I think that's where this kind of goes. I know you got to go. I appreciate the time you spent with me today, Natalia. You know, you guys are very, very busy. And I will bring Daria on, I think, next month. So we'll follow up with her. Cool. But thank you again. You also came to Future Worlds 2022. I really appreciate that. And we will talk to you very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. The most important to remember the digital fashion is not the future. It's already happening today. And as we say, it's so much more interesting to wear digital fashion rather than just listen about it. So just like start doing now. And uh, that's that's the way to do 100 percent. i enjoyed it thank you so much natalia talk thank to you very soon thank okay, you take care. thank you so much okay bye-bye bye-bye